Hello everyone. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Victoria. My name is Carrie Hunter and I'm the Senior Minister at the Center and it's a pleasure to welcome you here today. And we'd love to see you sometime in person if you want to drop by. We meet at the Cook Street Village Activity Center on Sundays, 1030 for meditation and 11 o'clock for our celebration service. It would be wonderful to greet you in person. But meanwhile, happy to have you here with me right here and right now. And my topic today is be authentically free. And I thought a lot about that in the past week, you know, what that really means, being authentically free. And, and what comes to my mind, and certainly speaking from past experience of my own, what comes to my mind is to be perfectly comfortable in your own skin, no matter where you are, no matter whom you are with, uh, be it a celebrity, royalty, um, a member of the family, a good friend, anyone, anywhere. Just being your absolute natural self because it is so comfortable. And I remember saying to one of my kids when they were younger, you know, just be yourself because it's easier for you and it's so much easier for the other person as well. Because we give off a vibration of some kind with whatever it is that we're we're doing or whatever it is we're speaking and energetically um, one can tell if we're not being authentic and it's it's not necessary it's not an, a comfortable thing and I can remember as a as a small child and again in my teen years and early adult years I wasn't authentic um, I didn't even know what that meant I remember someone a young woman who was working for me for a couple of years. She was from the United Kingdom and uh, just a beautiful soul. She used to call me Mama Carrie because her own mom had passed away when she was 16. And after a couple of years, she said to me, you know, I love you and I know you well, but there's a part of you that I just don't know and I don't understand it. And it came to me at that moment that there was a part of me that I didn't understand either, a part of me that I didn't know. And I realized that through my childhood and my teen years that I just wanted to be loved and to be liked by other people. And so I would kind of shapeshift depending upon whom I was with. I would, um, you know, I would want to be the person that they wanted me to be rather than just being my authentic self, the person that I didn't even know. And so it didn't happen immediately. It took some time. And I have to give great thanks to a, a wonderful teacher of mine, Reverend Terry Shea, uh, who's now retired. Um, I was going for my ministerial intensive and oral exams in Monterey, California. And I had, I had written my final exams and had passed. And so what that meant was, was going to Monterey where there was a huge conference each year for our centers and a week in advance some of the brightest minds in, in um, I was going to say in the business <laughs> some of the some of the brightest minds in uh, in centers for spiritual living were speaking to us to our class there were 25 of us and after that we would then go into um, oral panels with various ministers who would question us and have us pray and and then determine what level of skill we had and, and how we would graduate. And I had been studying for 13 years, but seven of that to become a practitioner, prayer practitioner, and then a minister. And my minister said to me, Terry said to me before I was leaving, the first thing they're going to do is line up all of those of you in the class, one at a time on stage, to tell people who you are. And he said, you're going to want to tell people about your past careers because you've had a few and they've all been extremely wonderful. But he said, don't do that. Your career is not who you are. And he said, I really want you to think about that. I want, to, I want you to think about who you be. And I want you to express that. Well, that kind of struck me dumb. Uh, but anyway, I, I went to Monterey, and the night before I was sitting thinking, who am I? Who do I be? 
because I know it's not important what I do. I know what's really important about all of us is who we be. And so I started out thinking, well, I'm a woman who values integrity and I value honesty and I value spirituality. I value love. I value joy. And I've, anyway, I went through this list of, of values, personal values. And then I went through a list of the things that were important to me. And so when I got up to speak, I, was, I happened to be the first one. And, and that's how I spoke. I talked about my values and I talked about the things that interested me the most in my life. And I was the only one of 25 people who did that. Everybody else talked about what their previous work had been or what their work was to that day. And I was so grateful to my teacher because I realized that through that exercise, I came to know who I really was. I journeyed into authenticity. And I was on that journey for a while. I was on that journey through my spiritual teaching, uh, and my spiritual classes. But it wasn't until I went through my values and, and the things important to me that I really went to a deeper place. And that was my God connection. Because those, those values are all the way that we express God in our lives. And I remember Wayne Dyer saying, it was after that, that when we're God-aligned, that we are our authentic selves. We're just exactly who we are meant to be. And I was, I was remembering Jack Boland, a wonderful unity minister. And I'd been in a workshop of his many, many, many years ago, probably three or four decades ago. And he was talking about his level of authenticity. It had been a journey for him. And he said, you know, he didn't explain how he got there, but he said, there's not a place that I could go where I would not be comfortable. There's not a person I could speak with that I would not be comfortable with. And he said, you know, that chair in the White House would be just comfortable enough for me. And I thought, wow, chair in the White House, that's pretty impressive. And of course, what he was saying was that he was himself, completely himself, wherever he went, no matter who he was talking to, no matter what he was doing. But it hadn't really rung true for me. I didn't quite understand it at that time. And then, of course, I read Terry Cole Whitaker's book, What You Think of Me is None of My Business, which is some of the best advice I think that I have ever seen for all of us because we can get so caught up in what others think about us that we lose sight of who we really are. And it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. What matters is who we be, that we understand, as Dr. Ernest Holmes, our founder, said, you know, we're each individualized expressions of God, all bits of God stuff. And I'm the Carrie part of God, and you are the Judy part of God, the George part of God, the whatever your name is part of God. And we all have equal amounts of it in us. He said, you know, Mother Teresa didn't have any more of it in her than, than any of us has. Jesus didn't have any more of it in him than any of us has. It's very democratic. We're all born with equal amounts of it. Think about that. So how do we express the God stuff that we are? How do, we, how do we speak? How do we react? How do we respond to things? How do we show up in the world? How do we expect God to show up? Because that's the expectation that we need for ourselves. And when we know that, it was Wayne Dyer who said, when we really know that we're aligned with God, when we really know this, that is when we become authentically free. Now, the way that we do this, the way that we become authentically free is through our spiritual practice. And I harp on this all the time because it's so important. It's about every day devoting time to meditation and to prayer, preferably first thing in the morning. And I do that first thing every morning. I've done it for a couple of decades before I do anything else. And it'll typically be about a half hour or so. Sometimes it's a bit longer. Sometimes it's a bit shorter, but 
but every, every day, faithfully, I have missed a few days in the last two decades, but I haven't missed many. And right now, because I'm teaching a practitioner class with my colleague um, Jennifer Tennant, we are doing prayer and meditation again every morning at 10 o'clock with our class. So we're getting an extra boost of it. And without that, we find, I find, that my life doesn't work as well. Now think about that. I've been doing this and then doing the extra teaching prat class. And I went off to Montreal last week for my granddaughter's graduation from McGill University. It was a wonderful experience. But coming home was just one problem after the other. Cancelled flights and lightning uh, storms and runways closed and... Um, you know, being told I wouldn't get on flights, um, eventually did get on flights. And I was flying into Vancouver from Montreal um, through Toronto. And then from Vancouver, I was taking my car onto the ferry to come home to, to uh, Victoria. And everything was going wrong. It was just absolutely abysmal. And I couldn't believe it. And when I arrived at the airport, finally, in Vancouver... At 2.30 in the morning, there was no bag. My baggage hadn't arrived. And I had been told in Montreal that my baggage was going on ahead of me on another flight, and it would be waiting for me when I got there. Well, it wasn't waiting. And I got to a friend's place at 3.30 in the morning to overnight with no bag, with absolutely nothing that I needed. And I was exhausted. And I slept, woke up in the morning, found the airline, was on hold for two hours and ten minutes, and was told that my bag was scheduled for delivery and that I would have it later that day. Anyway, I kept trying to, ch they said I could check online to see where it was. So I kept trying to check and there was no, no record of it anywhere. And I couldn't, I couldn't reach the baggage check-in um, site. So I called back another two hours online. And the, um, the person I was dealing with said, you know, you're the first person who's called today who hasn't yelled at me or sworn at me. And so I will do all I can to help you. So she started going through things. I had my, the, you know, the code number for my flight and I gave that to her. And she kept going and she said, oh, they've spelled your last name wrong. They put an E on the end of Hunter. That's why you can't log on. And she said, I see that it's out for delivery and you'll have it by seven o'clock tonight. And I said, is that seven o'clock sharp or is that seven-ish? And she said, seven-ish. And I said, okay, fine, I can deal with that. So I, I agreed with my friend I was staying with that I would stay over another night just in case. And um, 7 o'clock came, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, no bag. And, of course, the phone lines were closed for the night. So the next morning, I did the same thing. I was online again for, it was just over two hours. And um, I spoke to the person, and she, she said, well, and again, she said, you know, because you haven't yelled at me, I really wanted to help you. And so she she went on a search, and she said, well, um, it says here that it's scheduled for delivery, but you should have had it last night. Um, so she apologized. She said, you know, I'll make sure that this gets out for delivery. And uh, she said, right away, she said, I'll, I'll call the courier and I'll make sure. So anyway, a few more hours passed, nothing. So I phoned back again. This time I was only on hold for an hour and 15 minutes. And um, same story. Well, it's out for delivery. Don't know why you don't have it couple of hours passed, I phoned again. And this time I said, you know, I really have to go back to Victoria because I'm doing a celebration of life service and the materials that I need are in that, that suitcase, which is why it's so important to me. So will you please um, send it to my home in Victoria and, well, actually Sydney, and, um, and, and, have, and I'll, and I'll pick it up there because I really need to have it. But I need to get to the ferry because I have to get home. And so she said, I will check. This was These were all different um, agents I was speaking with. And she said, I will call the courier right away and have him deliver it to where you're staying right now. 
And so then she said, you stay online while I'm calling. I was on hold for 20 minutes. She came back on and she said, the courier has your bag and is going to deliver it right away. And I said, well, I have to leave for the airport, or I'd rather I have to leave for the ferry in 15 minutes. I can't wait longer than that. So please send it to Victoria. So she said, okay. And I went out, said goodbye to my friend, went out, got into my car to head to the ferry. And the courier drove in, handed me my bag, put it in the car. Now, what had happened, I realized, I was thinking, why is all this nonsense going on? I don't have things like this happen. And I thought, for almost a week, I had not done prayer or meditation. And I felt anxious. I had felt upset. Um, I, I really, really was out of sorts. But after my last, or, or the second last call to the airline, I excused myself from my friend who was very talkative. We were having great conversation, but we were starting early in the morning with that conversation and then continuing all day. And I wasn't doing my spiritual practice. So I excused myself and went into the bedroom and said, I'm going to pray. She's also a minister, and she said, and I'm going to visualize your bag here right now. So I went into the bedroom, and I prayed and meditated for quite a while. And I felt this perfect peace descend upon me. It didn't matter whether my suitcase made it or not. Nothing like that mattered. I was at peace with myself. I was at peace with God. And I knew that everything would just work out. What was in my suitcase could be replicated at home. And so I came out and, um, and I said to my friend, I just feel so much better. No matter what happens, I feel so much better. Of course, what happened is my suitcase made it exactly at the time that I was leaving my friend's place. And we both had a good laugh about that. Now, I looked at all of the things that had happened and I thought, there has to be a gift in this somewhere. Because when my life isn't working, I can always look and somewhere I can find a gift and what had been, what was going on that was nerve-wracking. When I flew to uh, Montreal on, on the flight, uh, I, I actually flew through uh, from Vancouver to Calgary, had a layover, and then Calgary to Montreal. And there was this wonderful flight attendant named Charles. And Charles sat with me for a little bit and chatted. He was just a delight and, uh, and was very, very helpful. Anyway, when I, I had the layover, and then when I got on the, the flight to Montreal, I thought, gosh, I mean, everybody's wearing masks. I thought, that guy looks a lot like Charles. I wonder if he has a brother. So he came, he came up to me, sat down, started to chat. And, and he said, what? He said, you're on the same flight. And I, I said, well, I said, I thought maybe you had a twin brother. Anyway, we laughed, and we, we talked a little bit more. And um, end of flight, he, you know, said he hoped he'd see me again sometime on the flight. And when I got to the airport in Toronto and was having so much difficulty, uh, who should walk up to the the um, the gate but Charles? And so he looked at me and he said, what are you doing here? He, he said, you've only been here a few days. And I said, well, I was here for my granddaughter's graduation and now I have to get home. And I'm just having all of these troubles. And he, he said, look, everything's delayed. People who were going to Iceland have been flown to L.A. to get a connection there. Um, he, he said, everything is just crazy. You're going, to get on, you're going to get on the next flight. Don't worry about it. And he said, the same thing is happening in Toronto. You'll get on that flight as well. And he said, I'm going to be on your flight to Toronto. But I, but he said, then I'm going to Edmonton. But he said, I'm just going to know that you'll make it. So we chatted. He asked me about my granddaughter. And I told him. And Charles' home was in Paris, although he'd not been back since the pandemic. And he was really looking forward to getting back again. And uh, uh, and when I arrived in in Vancouver, actually it was the next day because I was so tired, I opened up my email and there was an email from Charles with pages and pages of advice for Paris. You know, the best places to eat that weren't expensive, the best markets to go to to buy food, the best boulangerie, the best uh, chocolate shop. Um, shops, um, the things that, that were must-sees, the best walks to take around Paris. All of these wonderful things for my granddaughter. So I sent them to her and to my daughter and to my 
uh, and to my other granddaughter because I know that at some point everybody's going to be visiting and I've been blessed to have been in Paris many times but with a past career but I, I'm longing to go back and to be there when Jemima's there. So there was the gift in this, my interaction with Charles, that despite everything else seeming perfectly miserable, <laughs> there was this wonderful gift, and I'm so grateful for that. And again, that's what happens. You know, when we pray, when we meditate, when we, you know, I'm always saying it's like American Express, don't leave home without it. Don't ever leave home without it. And if you're going into some special meeting, sit in the car or sit outside for a few minutes and do it again. Not for that length of time, just for a few minutes. Just to be sure that you're in alignment when you go in because it makes all the difference. You know, and it's, it's not something that we should do. This is something that we must do. And when we do, we're in that place of authenticity. And otherwise, we're kind of like a boiling kettle that's getting close to the point of whistling and then just exploding almost. That's not what we want for our lives. And when we're like that, we're not being authentic with other people. We're uncomfortable in ourselves. We're possibly making them uncomfortable as well. You know, what is it that's inside us? What's in our minds? What's in our hearts? What's inside us? And I was thinking again about, you know, taking an orange and squeezing it. And what comes out of it is orange juice. Of course, it's pure. It's beautiful. Well, if somebody was squeezing me at the airport in Montreal, I wonder what would have come out. Wouldn't have been anything very pleasant. And so if somebody's squeezing you, what would come out in this moment or what would come out tomorrow, what, what might have come out yesterday or the day before? We need to be checking in constantly, checking in and asking ourselves, who are we? Understanding that we are spirit having a human experience, that we're just containers for God. And we can ignore that and not ever, ever understand it or realize it or align with it, but it's always there. And so it's through that contemplative daily practice that we not only become aware, but we feel it. And it is the most perfectly beautiful feeling that one could ever imagine. You know, it's kind of like taking the time to rebirth right here and right now, birthing as God, birthing as spirit, birthing as our divine nature. Yeah, birth can be messy at times, but the result is something incredibly beautiful and miraculous and wonderful. And so let's think about that and let's let go of the history of, you know, what was that didn't work and step into the mystery of authenticity and be, become authentically free. Be the God selves that we were born to be. God bless you all. And so it is. Thank you for being here today. If you would care to make a donation to our center, um, you can do that by sending an e-transfer to donate at cslvictoria.org or by logging on to our website cslvictoria.org and on our website you'll find a, a little button that says donate which will take you to PayPal so you can donate through PayPal um, or if you read the fine print underneath it asks if you would like to use a credit card or debit card instead and bypass PayPal and you can do that as well and just fill in the information there we're so grateful for all that you give, for all that you do, and we do hope that we can welcome you in person one of these days and that you'll stay afterward for, um, for tea or coffee and some goodies and some great conversation with people of like mind and consciousness. Meanwhile, have a wonderful blessed week and know that you are loved and you are love itself in expression. And so it is. Bye for now.